from the food we eat to the roads we travel and to the houses that we live in. Every part of our lives and the struggle for gender equality is impacted by economic policies. The push for unrestrained economic growth has worsened gender, racial and class inequalities around the world and weakened our government's ability to fulfill their human rights obligations. In December 2019, International Women's Rights Action Watch Asia Pacific convened a meeting of women's rights advocates and policy experts to understand how global economic and development structures impact the daily lives of women. The meeting revealed a common feminist vision focused on the redistribution of power, democratization of economic decisions, and control over economic resources at all levels, local, national, regional, and global. The devastating fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic for women across the globe, and especially those in marginalized groups in the global south, has highlighted the urgency of this vision for a global economic model that puts people and planet first. This video is an invitation to collaborate in that vision. So microeconomic policy are the economic decisions and policy taken at a national level. And so they really focus on how a country collects money and how much money it collects, mostly through taxes, but also through other ways, and how it chooses to spend that money. Those policies together are called fiscal policy. The monetary policy is about decisions of how much money is in the economy, which a government also decides. If we know how government decisions on education, health, and social services are connected to global economic actors, we get a fuller picture of who has decision-making power. This way, we can connect local issues to global systems, find pressure points for accountability, and create opportunities for solidarity. So macroeconomic policy impacts really uh, every aspect of women and men's economic lives and therefore it impacts every dimension of gender equality. Whether you're talking about um, violence against women or women's lacking political representation in society or lacking women's land rights, for example, all of those are representations of existing inequalities in society. And macroeconomic policy can basically exacerbate those inequalities or alleviate them, depending on the decisions of macroeconomic policymakers. Every time that there is a national budget planning, uh, the, the sector that gets mostly affected is uh, health and in terms of funding. When we do not have a country that commits most of its domestic resources to health, the women and girls are going to suffer. When the funding is cut, they suffer the most consequences in terms of access to contraception, access to information, to health and all those issues. So uh, it's very critical that we talk about economic and macroeconomic issues. The traditional way in which macroeconomic policy has been approached and continues to be approached is generally gender blind, as in they don't recognize how men and women are differently impacted by macroeconomic policies. And as a result of that, we see a lot of the types of policies that these institutions come out with continue to overwhelmingly undermine women's rights and gender equality. So an example of that is austerity. So austerity is a type of policy that is being promoted by loads of international finance institutions, and it's cutting of essential public services like education. The public sector is essential for gender equality and women's rights. To have strategies to deal with the care economy and the burden of the care economy, which is taken heavily by women, we actually need to have public health services. We actually need to have education services. We need to make sure that you don't have to spend four hours walking for water and being exposed to violence. So when we actually look at the specifics, women are in the forefront. And if it doesn't work for women, it absolutely doesn't work at all. 
A feminist analysis helps us to design policies that improve the everyday lives of women. This means connecting national and global economic systems to women's human rights to land, food, water and more. Who benefits from these systems? Who carries the greatest risk or burden? When you talk about economic issues of women, it is very important to focus on agriculture women workers because they are landless, so they are working on other people's fields. It's not even 2% of women who have land. Women do not have access and control over seeds. Both of these elements are very critical for uh, exercising your economic rights over uh, food production. With the emphasis on ethanol, which is a demand from European markets especially. The amount of land which is being used to grow sugarcane is increasing at a very high rate. The problem with sugarcane is that it stands for a whole year and the women are forced to go and work on the sugarcane fields because there is nothing else that they can do. They are not paid, they are landless, and they have also no food. Indigenous movement is revolving around the rights to land. When we talk about land, we talk about collective land, the ancestral lands. There are also ancestral oceans, ancestral seas, and it includes the resources therein. Indigenous women's struggle is not separate from this. We are also struggling for the recognition of uh, women's rights to land, whether that's ownership, um, control and management decision making. Um, in the context of the collective. States are still contesting the recognition of ancestral lands of indigenous peoples. Development aggression has already uh, come in. No? This is in the form of a lot of extractive industries, dams, resource extraction, and conservation, including climate initiatives, no? carbon capture, which is now dividing indigenous communities. Extractive industries come with a very extractive mindset. They get the gold, sell it somewhere without giving back to the community, leaving the community in this array and in conflict. So how is this impacting women? They get disenfranchised from their lands, from the roles of nurturing the land because it's already destroyed. They are left without livelihoods because all the resources are gone. A just and equal global system begins from a place of solidarity and is accountable to people and societies, not corporate or private sector interests. The governments say they don't have enough money. A lot of governments also say that the expertise that is needed and the efficiency are also with the private and the business sector. Now we have a bit of a problem here because the private sector cannot be involved unless it's a market orientation for them, unless they're going to be able to make some profit. And so much of what we care about isn't necessarily something that is quote unquote marketable. On the one hand, we listen to the argument that there isn't enough public money, therefore we need the private sector. And then we see that more of the so-called limited public money is actually being used not to provide the kinds of essential services, but to actually bring incentives to the private sector. And the other part of the uh, irony in this whole conversation is there's tons of public money. Um, it's just used in different ways. It's used for the military. It's used for a whole range of different areas that the state is responsible for and also with a lot of state policies they are actually not collecting the kinds of taxes that they should be collecting from the more wealthy whether it's corporations or individuals and so there could also be a lot more public money in the beginning we were just uh, solely talking about uh, access to sexual and productive health and rights access to health but realizing how in our advocacy work, uh, also at regional and global levels, everyone is also talking about financing for development, uh, in financing for health, financing for education, financing for different uh, sectors. We've had to adjust our advocacy work to broaden it up, to also understand all these economic justice issues, financing, how they work, how they operate, because 
we cannot be able to request for resource allocation to the issues we're advocating for without at the same time addressing the larger global issue. International finance institutions like the World Bank and especially the IMF really influence macroeconomic policy making at the national level. Because they are lenders, they have a huge amount of influence over the countries that they lend money to. They actually can directly decide or help decide a country what their macroeconomic policy should be in order to get the loans. And in the other way, they are considered as the international experts on macroeconomic policy making. International finance institutions, but particularly the IMF, they are considered um, really expert. And so almost all governments in the world look to these institutions to tell them what is acceptable macroeconomic policy. So that's how they're influential. We have a very long history of having bilateral agreements with IMF, with the International Monetary Fund. There is also the World Bank. Then we have uh, a lot of grants coming in from UK aid, USAID, then AusAid, Japan. All of them have conditionalities when they give money. Um, a lot of them are now asking outright for privatization, privatization in agriculture. In the beginning, Roots for Equity started working directly with women, and we found very soon that that doesn't work because men have absolute control over women's mobility. So we changed our tactics, and we started mobilizing and organizing men first. And now we find that if there are actually progressive men in any village, and they understand the politics of patriarchy, of globalization, of feudalism, they are very willing to include women in the force uh, to push against these uh, absolute structural barriers. Once they are politically organized, they are the very first to come and say, why don't you come and work and organize our women? Once we did the very first level, now they don't need us because they have their own cadre of women who are well-trained and are quite organized, understand the politics. So at the national level, it's really important to start just with your national government and in particular your finance ministry or your treasury where macroeconomic policy decisions are actually made and just look at how they collect taxes, what the public budget looks like and start questioning those decisions and start challenging them. The Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, are part of a global plan of action call Agenda 2030 for eradicating poverty and achieving sustainable economic, social, and environmental development. The Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, is an international human rights treaty that focuses on substantive gender equality and non-discrimination in all areas of life. There are discussions with uh, the voluntary signings of things like the Sustainable Development Goals, that they're aspirational and they sound good, but, they're, but where's the compliance? CEDAW is based on country reporting. So CEDAW has a much stronger explicit rights agenda. But so many of the issues that we're facing today are cross-border. Violence against women in Cambodia could be because of the operations of Canadian mining companies. And so we have this cross-border issue and we have this huge gap on extraterritorial rights, as it's called. And it seems to me that if we actually had a strategy to work the SDGs and CEDAW in conjunction, we would have a very powerful package. Part of that is building alliances. So there are formations at the different levels, from community to sub-national to regional to international alliances that we are doing. We aim towards this genuine democracy, and the genuine democracy question rests firmly on the principles of right to decision-making, 
and the decision making has to be in the people's hands. And if the decision making is with us, we will access control over how resources will be used. And they have to be used for the absolute welfare of our own people. Or whether it is women, whether it is children, it is the people with disabilities, aged. There are very, very different realms of people in any country. And every one of them has the right to live a decent, equitable life. And for us, there is no other way but to fight for control of our resources. Our feminism is also hard to be intersectional. We have also learned that we cannot work in silos. We also understand that the global, economic, ecological issues affect young feminists in different ways. We have to organize with people that are working on climate uh, crisis, for example, because one of the main issues that we're trying to articulate is that no one lives a single issue life. It's not like you're gonna need health and then tomorrow you need education and then tomorrow you need uh, money to go to school and all those issues. So. There is power in working together and sharing information. And as we coordinate, it's also very important that we mobilize more. There are many women's rights organizations that are working on different issues, but they haven't yet uh, connected the dots about how the issues they work on are linked to the global macroeconomic issues. So this is also uh, an important role that we have to take on uh, to mobilize more, but also to coordinate our efforts for maximum impact. If you want to work with us on this issue or find out more information, visit us at iwraw-ap.org. Thank you.